following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at karm.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers, taking your calls, and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Everybody, welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick. You're listening to Matt Slick Live. And... Uh, as usual, if you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. Today's date is, let's see, September 5th, 2024 for the podcasters and stuff. Hope to hear from you. If you want, you can give me an email. Send me an email. Just do that at info, info at karm.org, info at karm.org. And uh, put in the subject line, radio comment, radio question, and that should be fine. Just like that, we can get to them. We usually do them on Fridays. Now, I'll be, I'll be uh, on tomorrow, but uh, next Friday, the Friday the 13th, I'm going to be flying out, going to speak at a conference. I won't be on live on that Friday, Friday the 13th. Maybe we'll talk about Friday the 13th, where it came from, what, one of the theories about it. It's really interesting. So uh, there's that. And uh, for those of you who might be new to the show, Matt Slick is my real name. It is. Half as a work great for radio. I've got a voice for radio, they tell me, a name for radio, and a face for radio. So it all works out. Trifecta. And if you want, you can continue to listen. I deal with the issue of apologetics, the defense of the Christian faith, Christian theology, and speak against things like abortion, uh, LGBTQ, socialism, communism, speak against Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, women pastors and elders, uh, and all kinds of things that are from the Bible that we talk about because that the Bible is the truth, and uh, you need to believe what it says. You need to believe Jesus Christ is God in flesh who died on the cross, rose from the dead. That's what you must believe, you must affirm, and if you don't, then when you die, you'll be lost. We don't want that. All right. Having said all of that, let's get to Alan from Virginia. Alan, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, Matt. How's it going? It's going, man. It's going. What do you got, buddy? Uh, I had a question for you. I was listening to, I was trying to listen to different um, types of Reformed Calvinists and other types of uh, mm-hmm. subjects on um, with religion just to kind of expand my knowledge and whatnot. Sure. Um, and I came across uh, John MacArthur. Do you have any mm-hmm. opinions on him? Yeah, he's a good teacher, a good Bible teacher. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to go wrong with him. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I, I saw there that some people tend to uh, dislike him, but I don't. I don't know the whole uh, drama stuff w- with uh, MacArthur. Well, you know, who's going to like everybody? I mean, it's just how it is. Oh yeah. So. Uh, he's a good guy and uh, had good good stuff to say about him. You know, there's always differences of opinion. You know, he's a cessationist. I'm not kind of thing. But, you know, and he believes in preacher uh, or premillennialism. I don't. But those are irrelevant uh, as far as being a good Bible teacher goes. So he's a good Bible teacher and uh, worth listening to. And I would just, you know, say, yeah, no problem, man. No problem. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you have any other recommendations uh, for teach for pastors? Well, um, John MacArthur's pretty good, and uh, uh, James White's good, um, and, uh, oh, man, he works with James, I can't remember his name. Oh, I hate that. Okay, come on, who, who works with James, guys? Um, you know, I've talked to him several times, too. I'm just bad with names sometimes. Jeff, Jeff Durbin, thank you. So... Uh, yeah, Jeff Durbin's good. Uh, there, there's other good pastors out there. There really are. Uh, you know, I'm not, not knocking them. Vody Bauckham is good. Um, so, yeah, there's some good guys do you, out do, there. Do you have do any debates? Because I tried looking at MacArthur's debates, and I think he only had one. And it, then it, the format wasn't really a debate format, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I Yeah, I don't know about him doing debates. He's a pastor. He's not an apologist. And that's okay. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I do debates. I'll be in one in a couple of months or something like that, or I don't know, November. I got something scheduled. So, uh, trying to figure things out. But anyway, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, All right. I appreciate it, man. All right, man. 
God bless. God bless. You too. All right. Well, that's Alan from Virginia. We have three open lines. If you want, you can give me a call. The number is 877-207-2276. That's right. Anthony Rogers. I know Anthony. He's a good guy. He's also good. Yeah. All right. Let's get to Jermaine from California. Jermaine, welcome. You are on the air. Oh, hi, Matt. Hi. Um, my uh, my question today was about the King James version uh-huh. of the Bible versus others. Um, I know there's some controversy with some people, whereas King James only. I used to be one of those until I kind of matured, and I found that I have to use several versions to kind of get a as complete yeah. of a of a look at the Word of God as I can. But I have I have friends who are ministers who are still kind of wrapped up in that and. I still see the things I kind of struggle with is when I see words in italics and then I hear quotes about not changing the word of God and, you know, they tend to argue against each other. For me, some of the italics seem to only enhance the word and not alter it or take away from it. And some other versions I was a little, a little skeptical of, but I just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Well, um, so, the idea about translations is interesting. I'm going to give you an example. In Spanish, to say, I'm hungry, is literally, yo tengo hambre. I, I have hunger. If you do go literally, it's, I, I have hunger. Or, kind of literal is, I have hunger. Or, what it really means is, I'm hungry. But if you're in surf talk, it's, I'm craving grinds. So, you know, back in the day, back in the 80s and stuff like that, there was Grimmies and stuff. But anyway, the thing was, uh, in Southern California, the thing was that, uh, or thing is that when you translate, you, as far as equivalence goes, there's a an attitude that the translators will have, how much literalness versus how much meaning, because sometimes the meaning of literalness in our language doesn't quite work. Well, that's one issue. Another issue is the King James Version was translated with roughly 5th century documents, 5th and 6th. And they're good documents um, in Greek, but since then, older manuscripts have been found. And generally speaking, the older manuscripts are better, because the closer to the source, the less time there is for additions, slight copyist errors to have been made. So the King James is good, but the newer translations are better because they use older manuscripts and they use more colloquial terms and they're more updated in our our language. In the 1611, the original version, people don't use it because you could hardly read it. So they use a later version in the 1700s and it's updated and that's the kind of style of of English that is used in the King James. And that's fine. Now, one of the things the King James people like to say is that the new translations take things out. They take the Word of God out. They take the truths about Christ out. But they just assume that the King James was perfect and that it uh, it was a perfect trans- transmission of texts. Well, the older manuscripts show that there were a few additions to the text, usually marginal writings that became included. And the King James picked up on those and used those. So it's not an issue of modern translations taking things out. It's that the King James put things in that weren't really there. So that's really what's going on, and and that's how to look at it, okay? Okay, yeah, thank you. That answers my question. Okay. Well, good. You know, hope that helps. And uh, King James is fine. I don't argue with people about it. Uh, unless they want to say the King James is the only true translation, then I then I tackle them on it. I go, let's talk. So, okay. All right, man. Okay, I guess that's it. Hey, folks, if you want to give me a call, all you have to do is dial eight seven seven two zero seven two two seven six. We have nobody waiting right now, and I'm going to let you know that we stay on the air by your support. Please consider supporting us. Um, we ask five for ten dollars a month and it's easy to do just go to carm.org c-a-r-m dot o-r-g forward slash donate and it'll take you to uh, whatever you need we have a new system in and you'll be able to go in and uh, change your stuff and do whatever you want to do whenever you want 
and so that's a new system and we'll be moving stuff over gradually as the years progress from the old to the new and uh, there you go all right now since we have nobody waiting um, I think what I'll do is get to some of the radio questions that have been um, uh, been coming in uh, via email again if you want to email me the number is 877 excuse me <laughs> <laughs> Please email me. Uh, just email me at info at carm dot org and put the subject line radio comment radio question and we can get to them. And just a reminder, um, I'll be down in Salt Lake City. Uh, I'm going to hear a friend preach uh, on Sunday, but next week, Friday the thirteenth, I fly to Southern California. I'll be on a panel discussion on Friday the thirteenth in the evening. Uh, Lord willing, uh, they're discussing Islam at the uh, Calvary Chapel of Yorba Linda. Calvary Chapel of Yorba Linda, uh, that'll be on Friday the 13th. Yorba Linda is in Orange County, Southern California. And then on the, uh, I'll be speaking on the next day, the same church, uh, three lessons I'm going to do on the hypostatic union, which I, I'm really looking forward to, the two natures of Jesus. I'm going to show people stuff they don't know about. It's going to be great. Also, what did Jesus accomplish on the co- on the cross? I'm going to show them some things people don't know that he did on the cross. And I have 23 things I could go through, but I'm only going to get to 10 because I just don't have time. And then I'll be preaching on who is a better moral example uh, or teaching on, on that. Is Jesus or Muhammad going through that? And uh, then on, on uh, the following Sunday, let's see, 13th, 14th, the 15th, I will be, uh, by God's grace, preaching two sermons at the uh, Calvary Chapel in Norco, in, uh, which is off the 15 freeway north of the, I think it's north of the 91. North of 91? Yeah, it is. On the way up to Ontario. I used to live in the area, so it's been 20 years, though, but I remember that, so it is. Anyway, whatever. All right. Hey, let's get to some of the questions. Here's a chain of questions that came up in our Fully Man, Fully God texting chat. Is original sin actually sinful? Okay, now the way the sentence is structured is sin sinful. Uh, sin doesn't sin. Sin is an abstraction. It's something that we do, and it occurs in the mind and the heart with intention. And um, so original sin is simply what Adam did. Uh, he sinned by rebelling against God, eating of the fruit, and we were made sinners by what he did. The many were made sinners. That's Romans 5.19. is the uh, here is passive indicative. And that means that it happened to us. Uh, and we received the action of, of his fault to us. That's what it says. That's original sin. And then the question goes on, or is it a nature to desire to do sinful things? Well, um, because of Adam's sin, we are born with sinful natures, and that would be, I'd be found in uh, well, Romans five nineteen again. Uh, through the transgression of the one, the many were made sinners, and in Adam all die. First Corinthians fifteen twenty two. Uh, but we are all also nat- by nature children of wrath. Ephesians two three because that's just how we are. We're born of a sinful lineage, and so we inherited the fallen nature as well as a sinful nature of Adam to ourselves. And so, uh, that's it. We do have a desire to do sinful things because it's part of what we are now. Hey, there's the music. If you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. We'll be right back. Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. You can give me a call, 877-207-2276. Look at the Chad from Ohio. Chad, welcome. You're here. Chad, you there? Chad. I'm waiting for you, Chad. Let's give him a few more seconds. Here. No, Chad. Chan? Oh, okay. Yeah, well, sorry about that. All right, so uh, what do you got, buddy? You're on no, the that's, air. That's, that's, that's all right. Um, yeah, I already say that uh, the King James added stuff to it, mm-hmm. and that the newer translations are more accurate. I, what did the King James add? Yeah, I, I never there were several. 
there's several things like the longer ending of Mark, Mark 16, 9 through 20. There's some serious doubt about its validity because it doesn't appear in most of the older manuscripts, plus has 17 non-Markan words used in a non-Markan sense. In other words, 17 words appear in those 11 verses that don't appear anywhere else in the entire Gospel of Mark. That's one thing. The uh, the comma Jehanium, for example, First John five seven and eight, uh, it's it's not considered to be reliable, and it's in the King James, but not in older manuscripts. And uh, there are translation issues. Romans five eighteen, for example, it really does a bad translation of that, which is a very critical verse. Uh, Titus two thirteen, it doesn't understand apparently the Granville Sharp rule when it comes to Greek translation about different articles inside of, of nouns and things like that. So there, there's, there's places you can find more information uh, and stuff like that. There's the, if you yeah, go to the I modern... To, I'm going to have to do some looking now. Yeah. And, and it's not, not to say that King James isn't trustworthy. It's just that uh, uh, they did a good job with what they had. And we've, since then, older manuscripts, more reliable manuscripts have been discovered. And the newer translations, uh, newer, newer Bibles use those. Okay. Okay. Not a big deal. That, that, that's all I had. I just never heard that before. I was like, okay, so I'll have to look at these in Mark. Sure, no problem. Sounds good. All right. All right you have a great day. Thank you. God bless. You too. God bless. <laughs> All right, well, we have nobody else waiting. Slow day today. If you want, you can give me a call, 877-207-2276. So uh, let me get back to some of the questions that were asked. Uh, is original sin passed down to everyone as a result of being human? Yes, it is, except for Jesus, because Jesus did not have original sin. And the theory behind that is that he was not... Uh, biologically descended from the male and so it looks like the authority and representation is in the male federal headship which is the male represents the descendants Adam and Eve were in the garden she sinned first but sin entered the world through one man Adam Romans five twelve. so some think because in the virgin birth there was no male activity uh, involved um, only God and Mary, then the original sin was not passed down to Adam, I mean to Jesus, excuse me. And it says, or has it passed down from one father figurative, and if he already addressed that, was Jesus born without a sin nature? Uh, yes, he was born without a sin nature, the Immaculate Conception from God. The Immaculate Conception in Catholicism deals with Mary, not Jesus. The Immaculate Conception teaches that Mary was born without sin, which is ridiculous. It's just, I wish they'd stop their idolatry. Anyway, uh, the Immaculate Conception from God allow him to be someone that is able to overcome original sin. So it's not that he overcame it, he just didn't, wasn't affected by it. Uh, he says, uh, comment, because some preach that a Jesus that is affected by original sin is heretical. That's correct. He, to say he does not have a sinful nature, that, that's the best view, that's the proper view. And that original sin nature could not be passed down by Jesus' mother, only male. That seems to be the seems to be the case that seems to be what's going on all right let's get on with jacob from michigan jacob welcome you're on the air hey matt and uh hey. it was missouri i i probably misspoke um it's all right i i was wondering if you could clarify uh jesus being the word and what the word means like I, i'm having trouble grasping that okay all right, so we have to start with the Trinity first in order to do that. So the Trinity is the okay. teaching that God exists eternally as one being, and he is divinely simple. Divine simplicity means that God is one substance, one thing. Within the one substance of God are three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, or the Word, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The ontological trinity is that all of the members, all the persons, share the same essence and properties. The, the economic trinity designates that the three persons have differences in their relationship to each other and to us. The Father begets, the Son is begotten, the Holy Spirit convicts the world. All right, so we see things like that. 
So when we talk about the Word that became flesh, what's happening is, uh, let me take a little bit of time and show you some stuff here. If we go to Genesis 1-1 and we go to John 1-1, we see a parallel. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, yep. God, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1-1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. But you go back to Genesis, it said, God said in verse 3, let there be light. And there was, uh, there was light. That's verse 3. Well, uh, in verse 4 of, Genesis, of John 1, you know, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So we see a parallel. And it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's John 1, 14. So what this means then is that the second person of the Trinity, the eternal word, became incarnate in the person of Christ so that the one person of Christ has two natures a divine nature and a human nature and we call this the hypostatic union that's who Jesus is so Jesus began his existence 2,000 years ago because Jesus by definition is the union of the two natures that began that union began 2,000 years ago however the divine nature of course is eternal so the hypostatic union says the one person is the word and human nature, God and man, joined but not mixed, not combined, not made into a new third thing, new third thing that is, but uh, uh, made into in a union uh, into the one person. And then the attributes of both of those natures are ascribed to the single person. That's called the communicatio idiomatum, the communication of the properties. That's who Jesus is, okay? Okay. Um, and I I, had, uh, I noticed that from Genesis and then from John, it was it was similar. Like, it, he did that on purpose. Yes, he did. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Because the right. God, if you notice, God said, let there be light. And he was the creator, right? And right. John, in Isaiah forty four twenty four, God says he makes all things alone by himself. No one was with him. You go to John 1, 16, talking about Jesus. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, and visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Ooh, now that's interesting stuff. All right, does that answer it, buddy? We got a break. Yes, uh, okay. perfect. Thanks, Matt. All right, man. You're welcome. God bless. Hey, folks, we'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. 877-207-2276. Be right back. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. Let's get back on the air here with uh, Rebecca from Salt Lake City. Rebecca, welcome. You're on the air. Yes, hello, Matt. Can you hear me? Hi. Hi, I hear you fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was just listening to you um earlier when you first came on that you're going to be in Salt Lake City and I wondered mm-hmm. again I missed the date and the time and where could you please tell me I'd like to go on. well I'm just going down Saturday and I'm going to spend the night with uh, some oh. friends um, and then a oh. Sunday I'm going to go hear a friend of mine preach and we're going to hang around a little mm-hmm. bit afterwards and then come home that's all might go to okay. a restaurant might not okay you know. yeah. okay um, oh, yeah, yeah, well, you can, in the meantime, celebrate my birthday. I was born on the 7th, on Labor Day that year, 48. <laughs> wow, well, good. Okay. Yeah, I'll be yeah. driving down on the 7th. Anyway, Happy birthday um, to you. Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, um, I went to, uh, uh, you heard about the Pope about a long time ago, saying about the uh, homosexuals, transgenders, they were welcome in the church. You remember that? Well, they should be welcome in the church. I mean, all sinners well, should be welcome you know in the I mean. church, yeah. But they're, yeah. they're not to hold, hold offices or anything like that, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, because um, they weren't allowed in the uh, the LDS church here, the Mormons. 
until uh, it was, I think it was about a week ago when I heard the president say that they are now welcome. <laughs> are, are you LDS? Perhaps you can. Am I? Yeah. No, I'm Christian. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm okay. You know, I was raised Catholic, you know, okay. and uh, uh, when I went to church as a little girl, I knew we went every Sunday, but, uh, you know, I didn't know about Jesus. And they, okay. uh, plus the preacher, uh, um, did the Mass in Latin. <laughs> so, yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, well, it's ridiculous know. Thing. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. So, anyway, and I just wanted to, if I'm correct, the last gentleman that called, and we were talking about Jesus and of the uh, God, Jesus, and the Spirit. Um, mm-hmm. Don't we call that the Trinity? That's the Trinity, isn't it? Yes, uh, the Trinity is one God in three right. distinct simultaneous persons. The Mormon exactly. Trinity is three separate gods. And that's a heresy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was the Trinity, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, they call well, it Trinity, but it's not. Dimension. You're welcome, then. Okay. Well, God bless. Okay. You have a good day. All right. You too. Thanks. And happy birthday. All right. Um, For those that we don't have anybody waiting right now, yeah, in fact, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, Mormonism does teach that the Trinity is a triad. They don't use, it's not really a Trinity, it's a triad. The Trinity, by definition, is one being not three gods. A triad is three gods. The Trinity is one God who simultaneously exists as three persons, just the same way as time simultaneously is past, present, and future. But we experience only the present, and we distinguish between past, present, and future by their relationship to each other and to us. And so past, present, and future are all the one thing, but there's different aspects of the same thing. And they are, they're there. So that's just an analogy. But in Mormonism, there's a God, the Father. There's another God, the the uh, Jesus, and another God, the Holy uh, the Holy Ghost. And then there's a goddess wife too. So uh, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, said this in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page three seventy. He said, "I have always declared God to be a distinct personage." Jesus Christ, a separate and distinct personage from God the Father, and that the Holy Ghost is a distinct personage and a spirit. And these three constitute three distinct personages and three gods. That's what Joseph Smith taught, the founder of Mormonism. And out of the 70s quorum, uh, Milton R. Hunter said uh, in his Pearl of Great Price commentary, page 52, Excuse me. The ancient prophets knew that the Godhead consisted of three separate and distinct personages, each of whom had a definite work to perform, and yet they all worked in perfect unity as one. The three gods constituted the Holy Trinity. So you can see this is what Mormonism teaches, that there are three gods, and of course that's a false teaching. And we know that's a false teaching because of what the Bible says. It's very easy to get to and show you, and I will right now. And by the way, as I go to look up these verses, uh, in Mormonism, God the Father's name is Elohim, and the name of Jesus is Jehovah. So that's what they say, except the Bible says uh, Jehovah is Elohim, for example, in 1 Kings uh, 8.60. Anyway, in Isaiah 43, 10, uh, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, declares Jehovah, and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed. You know Elohim is what the word is, God there. And there will be none after me. You can also go to Isaiah 43, 6, which says, thus says Jehovah, Uh, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, Jehovah of hosts. I am the first and I am the last and there is no God besides me. That's what it says. Okay? And Isaiah 44, 8. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me or is there any other rock? I know of none. Now, who's talking? That's Yahweh. That's Jehovah. If you read verses 6, 7, and 8, that's Jehovah's talking. He says, is there any God besides me? 
I know of none. See, in true biblical theology, Yahweh is simply, Jehovah Yahweh, is simply the name of God, the name of Elohim. It's just the word God. That's all Hebrew is. The word for God in Hebrew is Elohim. Like the word in Spanish is, is Theos. Uh, and uh, Or Dios, excuse me. <laughs> in Greek is Theos. And uh, so in different languages have different words for God. And in Spanish, it's Dios. And, and uh, Greek, Theos. And in Hebrew, it's Elohim. That's all. And so what's Elohim's name? What's the name of God? It's Yahweh. But the Mormons say, no, Jehovah is, or Yahweh, Jehovah, is the, is Jesus, and Elohim is the Father. It, it just doesn't work. It's just not true. We can also go to Isaiah 45, 5. And uh, let's see. There we go. I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. There is no Elohim besides me. That's what it says right there in uh, Isaiah 45, 5. So you know what happens when I talk to Mormons and I show this to them? They just skirt it. They just believe something else. They choose to ignore it. Why? Because they're Mormons. They're not Christians because they're loyal to Joseph Smith and they have a testimony, they bear witness uh, in their hearts. The hearts desperately wicked and deceitful while making trust in Jeremiah 17, 9. But they trust their hearts. They trust that God has given them a testimony. But when I compare my testimony to theirs, I've never heard a Mormon whose testimony is as strong and as powerful as mine. Seriously. I'm not saying, hey, look, my testimony can beat up your testimony. But the point is... Uh, even when I've talked to Mormons and given them my testimony of how I got saved, I say, Can, is yours stronger than that? And no one's ever said, yes. You ever had that happen to you? No. Then why is it that what I believe is so different from what you believe? I bear witness to you in the name of Jesus Christ by the authority of the Lord Jesus that there's only one God in all existence in all place and all time. He was never a man on another planet. That Joseph Smith was a false prophet. That Mormonism is not of God. It's a deception from the devil. And he has deceived so many in it. And you want to know why he's so successful in it? Because he gets people to trust their hearts. Well, people say, no, Jeremiah, excuse me, uh, James 1, 5, let, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Well, we, the context is talking to those who are already believers in God, not praying about a book to see if it's true. You don't pray about God's word. You don't say, God... Where's the Bible say that it's true? Can I pray and ask you if it's true? It's true because it's his word. He doesn't need you to ask him for verification because he is simply the one who speaks truth. It's true because it comes from him. What Mormons do, they don't realize, is they're undermining the very nature of God's authority and work. When they say, I'm going to pray about something other than his word, the Book of Mormon, from a guy who said he saw God the Father. When the Bible says, but you can't see God the Father. In First Timothy 6.16, he dwells in unapproachable light who no man has seen or can see. But they don't care. They say, he could see him. Joseph Smith saw him. How do you know? Because I tell you, I have a testimony that makes it true. In other words, what they're doing is trusting their so-called testimony above the very clear, specific word of God. That is why God allows them to be so deceived, because they essentially are calling God a liar when they deny his word, because God has spoken through the apostles and prophets. God dwells in unapproachable light who no man has seen or can see, First Timothy 6.16. The Mormons say, that's not true. Then God says, if that's how you're going to be, then you're opening yourself up to demonic influence because you're not believing the truth. And so they believe the lie, hence they believe Mormonism. Be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. It's Matt Slick Live. Taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I just want to remind you that we do need your support, if you'd be so kind, is to consider supporting us at $5, $10 a month or more if you want. All you have to do is go to carm.org, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G forward slash donate. You can do it one time or whatever you want. Information's right there. Scott from Spokane. Hey, Scott. Welcome, man. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Hanging in there, man. Hanging in there. What do you got, buddy? Um, can we go to uh, Hosea 
chapter 2, verse 16. Hosea 2. I had a... It will come out in the day, yeah. declares the Lord, that you will call me Ishi and no longer be uh, call me Baal, ba- Baali. Yeah, okay. Yeah, what is that about? What, what's what's being said here? God, it, it has to do with the word husband. And um, look at my notes. I, don't, I want everybody to think I have all this memorized. I have a great Bible program. And so it says, you'll call me Ishi. And when you put the mouse over the number one, it says, i.e., my husband. And Baali... Uh, my master or my Baal. Uh, so, E, uh, Lo Ami in Hebrew is not my people. Lo is not, um, and E at the ending is uh, um, the, the kind of like, like a, a negator thing. Or, uh, well, anyway, so uh, actually it isn't. But um, so what he's talking about is, or I think my, especially with my, that's right. So what he's saying is uh, because of what the people of Israel were doing at that time he was going to punish them he restores them later and uh, he prophesies that he'll restore them later in Hosea chapter 2 but because of their idolatries and stuff like that you'll no longer I'm not, if you, I won't be your husband all it is is God speaking metaphorically uh, the husbandry the word husband is interesting it comes from I believe it's an agrarian agricultural Context where a husband was uh, a person who took care of things on the in the land in the field the animals and things like that and it's called husbandry. So in fact, uh, whoops, let me get over here. Uh, husbandry, look it up, and this might shed a little bit of light on that from an ancient um, context. It was, uh, yeah, it was the. Yeah, that's right. Husbandry was a practice of cultivating crops and raising animals, uh, the careful management, conservation of land. And so the word has it drifted into marriage so that the husband, the man, is the one who takes care and guards and things like that. So this same kind of a thing could be related to the husbandry of God to Israel. And so then he's saying to them, no, uh, I'm not going to be your husband not going to be the one taking care of you that way. And it's because of their spiritual idolatry. So he takes the word and uses it that way uh, in kind of a double meaning in what God is doing. Also, he divorces Israel, too, in Jeremiah 18.8. I think that's where that is. No, that's not it. Where does he divorce Israel? He issues a writ of a certificate of di- divorce, a writ of divorce. And um, maybe mm-hmm. Charlie will put it in. He knows things, too. Uh Given, yeah, there it is. Jeremiah three eight. I was thinking eighteen eight, but that's something else. So Jeremiah three eight. Uh, I saw for all adulteries of faithless Israel, I'd sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. So the the marriage husbandry language is there from God to Israel. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, that's all I got. But I just wanted to let you know. I don't have it in front of me right this second. I just wrote it down. But Mm -hmm. Hosea 1, verse 6, appears to be a limited atonement supporting verse, if you want to check it out or whatever. But but yeah, that's it. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter, and the Lord said to him, Name her Loruhamah, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel, that I I would ever forgive them. Um, uh, The house of Israel. Yeah, and then if they repent, Jeremiah eighteen eight, then he relents. That's what God is. But yeah, I, I wouldn't use that one so much. But I, I, I see it. Okay, there you go, buddy. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank All you, right, man. All right, Talk well, God bless. Soon. Okay, God Me bless. Too. All right, now let's hey. get to Luke from Ohio. Luke, welcome. You're on the air. Thank you. It's uh, very nice to talk to you. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, my qu- my, yes, my question is, uh, I was raised Catholic for 45 years, and over the last 10 years, uh, I became very interested in uh, the true Christian faith, uh, and I love verse-by-verse uh, teachings. I love listening to them and, and learning to them. Uh, I've spent a lot of time listening to different uh, pastors from Calvary Chapel, um, mm-hmm. especially Joe uh, Folk from Philadelphia, and I was just wondering what your opinion was of, of those, uh, you know, that brand of teaching from Calvary Chapel. Yeah, sure. Um, surprisingly, uh, I was 
I was in Southern California where Calvary Chapel started, and the founder of Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith, baptized my wife and I together out in the ocean. And she and I were married by a Calvary Chapel pastor, and we used to go to Calvary Chapel. In fact, um, I have a good friend up here in Idaho who's a Calvary Chapel pastor, and I preached in his church. Next, not this week, but the weekend after, I'll be at a Calvary Chapel in Yorba Linda, California, uh, speaking uh, at a conference. And then the next day on the 15th, I'll be preaching at a Calvary Chapel in uh, Norco, Southern California. So uh, Calvary Chapel is, uh, is a good, basic church. If you want deep theology, you need to go to a Reformed church and find out about those later. But Calvary Chapel is a good place to be. Their pre-trib, pre-tribulation rapture stuff, which I don't agree with, but okay. But you're going to get verse by verse, you're going to get good stuff to focus on Jesus, not on sacred tradition and not all these wacko things the Catholic Church has added. You won't be praying to Mary. You're going to be looking at the Word of God verse by verse, and Calvary Chapel is known for that. Okay. Yes, thank you. I think that uh, what what uh, I learned so much in the last ten years of my life uh, about having a true relationship with Christ uh, than I did in the forty five years that I was in the Catholic Church. Right. Yeah, because in Catholicism, so. your relationship with God is uh, governed by the authority of the priesthood in the Catholic Church, and you have to go through all the rituals. So it steps in the way between you and Christ, and so that's what that is. Yeah. I. Yeah, I was also, raised to think that, that that God was a. Go ahead. Yeah, that God was. You know a, that that God was just wait, wait waiting to punish me, and uh, I was always in fear of Him. But uh, uh, recently, like I say, over the last ten years, uh, understanding His grace and Christ's sacrifice, and and having a true personal relationship with uh, Jesus mm-hmm. Christ uh, makes me feel yeah. it makes me feel so comfortable. Uh, being in relationship with him. So I thank you for your answer. Good. You know, what you're saying there is out of 1 Corinthians 1 9, which says, God is faithful through whom we are called into fellowship with his son, Christ Jesus. Fellowship is a, a communion, it's you spend time with, with, the, with the Lord. He's the one we're supposed to have fellowship with. We go straight to him. And you will see more and more of that in Calvary Chapel. All right? It's not perfect. But it's it's Amen. better than than Calvary than the Catholic Church by far. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, God bless. Okay. All right. That's Luke from Ohio, and now let's get to Charles from Dayton, Ohio. Hey, Charles, welcome. You're on the air. Charles. Hello. How are you? Hey, there you go. All right, man. So, what do you got, big guy? Well, my wife, um, she's uh, 74, and she's had, she was diagnosed with, uh, we knew something was wrong. She'd been on uh, rescue inhalers for a long time, but she's diagnosed with COPD uh, June of uh, 2023. Mm-hmm. And then she's had, uh, the pulmonologist thought she had a, uh, a lung cancer uh, nodule. And so, so she went to uh, Indianapolis, and they verified it was, you know, first stage. And then she's had five uh, radiation treatments, and they said that it was shrinking. And uh, that was months ago, and now she goes in the 10th to get another CT scan to see how it's doing. Okay. But uh, the, the daily daily problem that just is wearing um, me out and even our daughters uh, uh, you know are they've, they've tried to help but they're you know about uh, they, they kind of uh, feel defeated too but she uh, her appetite I mean she'll get hungry but she cannot visualize you know maybe she'll one day she'll say you know get me this and uh, actually, in the in the four years that we well, well, let me, moved let me ask you, from, do you have a do you have a question? I mean, let's, do you have a question in there? Yeah, she uh, 
Have you ever heard of any? I, I've asked medical people, uh, specialists. Ever heard, of, ever heard of what? Uh, about the fact that she she can't, just like a little bit ago, she wants, she's she hungry. She wants me to bring her home supper, <laughs> but she doesn't know what she wants. Do, and she what's says, your, do you have a question, though? Can you, let's get right to it. If you had a formulated question, what would it be? Do you know anything? Uh, do you have any experience with anything like that? Uh, like what? Spiritually or physically? <laughs> what, uh, an somebody eating disorder? That, somebody that gets hungry, but they don't know what, they, they can't visualize uh, eating anything. Yes, uh, it happens to all kinds of people. They just get hungry. Hung, uh, hunger is a physiological thing, and the satisfaction of it can be an emotionally based thing. A lot of people who are traumatized turn to food to help themselves as a comforter. Uh, and so some people who are under distress can have that as well and where food it causes you to feel good and so people will often turn to that as a way of self-medicating and then it can become problematic uh, stuff like that so sometimes I'll say to my wife I'll say you know I'm hungry I want something nice but I don't know what I want and then I say to her because she's my wife I say can you solve that problem for me and then she gives me this weird look but uh, it happens. It's just something. It's not a big deal. You know, we're just going to say, I, I'm hungry, but I don't know what I want. That's fine. It's not a big deal. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's been every day for the last at least four years. And I've gone to, okay. there's probably well, 30 different places that I've gone to. And most of them she can't go back to now. Okay. Uh, so you, your job as a husband is to be as supportive of her as you can with this. COPD is, is serious, and it might be a coping mechanism that she's having because it causes stress to the body, and she might just be reacting that way because of the stressors that are there and the, what's associated emotionally with COPD. So your job is to just be comforting and not add to the stress, but uh, guide her in it with prayer and love and patience, okay? Okay. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. You're, you're welcome. Well, God bless. All right. Hey, we are out of time. May the Lord bless you. Now, by His grace, we'll be back on the air tomorrow. And I just want to remind you that we could use your support. Please consider supporting us. Just go to carm.org, C A R M dot O R G forward slash donate. And uh, we'd appreciate that. And by His grace, like I said, we'll be back on the air tomorrow. And we'll talk to you then. So have a great evening, everyone. God bless. Another program powered by the Truth Network.